Hi Year 5, this is our new book, Beowulf, that we're going to be using for reading skills. It's been drawn on, I'm afraid, but never mind. Here we go. Beowulf and Grendel, the monster of the night. Hear and listen well, my friends, and I will tell you a tale that has been told for a thousand years and more. It may be an old story, yet, as you will discover, it troubles and terrifies us now as much as it ever did our ancestors, for we still fear the evil that stalks out there in the darkness and beyond. We know that each of us in our time, in our own way, must confront our fears and grapple with this monster of the night, who, given a chance, would invade our homes and even our hearts, if he could. So roll back the years, back uh, to the 5th century after the birth of Christ, and come with me over the sea to the Norse lands, where we, uh, we now know as Sweden and Norway and Denmark, to the ancient Viking lands of the Danes and the Geats, the Angles and the Jutes, and this will be our here and now, as this tale of courage and cruelty unfolds, as brave Beowulf batters, battles with the forces of darkness, first with that foul fiend Grendel, then with his sea hag of a mother, and last of all with the dragon death of, of the deep. The story begins as all stories do, before it begins, for there is always a mother before a mother and a king before a king. In Denmark, all the great lords, those royal descendants of Skild, that great and good king, followed in his footsteps and stayed strong against their foes and loyal to their friends. The kingdom prospered. From their conquests the land grew rich, so that people flourished and were happy. Feared by their enemies, loved by their allies, the kingdom of the Danes became great and powerful in the world. Then the Lord Hrothgar came to the throne, son of the old King Helfdene, great-grandson of Skild, and he was to become the greatest warrior king of them all. Fierce in battle, he fetched home more treasures from his conquests than had ever been seen or even dreamt of in Denmark. But he was generous too and a good father to his people, so that they obeyed him always gladly. Hearing of his increasing glory in battles, more and more warriors came to join him. It seemed to them and him that there could never be an end to all his power and wealth. The kingdom was safe from its enemies, the people warm at their hearths and well fed. Truly it was a land of sweet content. To celebrate these years of prosperity and plenty, Hrothgar decided he would raise his people a huge mead hall. It must, be, it must, he declared, be larger and more splendid than any mead hall ever built. Only the best timbers were used, only the finest craftsmen. At Hrothgar's bidding, they came from all over Denmark to construct it, so that in no time at all the great hall was finished. He, it was truly even more magnificent than he had ever imagined it could be. Hirot, he called it, and at the first banquet he gave there, Hrothgar, by way of thanks, gave out to each and every person rings and armbands of glowing gold. No king could have been kinder, no people as proud and as happy. Night after night they feasted in Hirot and listened to the music of the harp and the song of the poet. And every night the poet told them that story they most loved to hear, how God had made the earth in all its beauty, its mountains and meadows, seas, skies, how it had made the sun and the moon to light it, the corn and the trees to grow on it, how he gave life and being to every living creature that crawls and creeps and moves on land or in the sea or in the air. And man too he made to live in this paradise. Around the warming hearth they listened to the poet's story, enraptured, enthralled, entranced. But there was another listener. Outside the walls of Hirot, in the dim and in the dark, there stalked an enemy of hell itself, the monster Grendel, sworn enemy of God and men alike, a beast born of evil and shame, he heard that wondrous story of God's good creation, and because it was good, it was hateful to his ears. He heard the sweet music of the harp, and afterwards the joyous laughter echoing through the hall as the mead horn was passed around. Nothing had ever so enraged this beast as night after night he had to listen to all this happiness and harmony. It was more than his evil heart could bear. Thank you.
The night Grendel struck was the darkest night of all. He waited until Hrothgar had gone to bed, until only the lords who nightly guarded Hirot were left. They were fast asleep when he pounced. He was upon them so suddenly with such violence and fury that none could escape the terrible slaughter. Thirty lords he mastered it, murdered in his bloodlust, as savage and as swift in his death-dealing as the maddened fox in the, hut, in the chicken hut. He left not one of them alive, but carried them off, home to his lair to feast on their bloodied corpses at his leisure. Only when day broke did Hrothgar and his warriors discover the dreadful evidence of the Holocaust of Her at Herot. Gone now were the laughter and the music. Hrothgar sat silent in his grief and despair. His warriors too mourned and lamented the loss of their friends and brothers in arms. All were stunned at the merciless cruelty of this fatal fiend of the darkness. But the horrors were not over yet, for the next night Grendel came again, stalking over the foggy moors and down through the forest towards Herod. The warriors had barricaded themselves in this time and believed they must be safe. They could not have known that against this hellish monster, monster all defences would be useless. In a frenzy of hate, Grendel burst in and slaughtered everyone he found there, gorging himself at will. He spared no one. From that night on, no one, not even Hrothgar, dared sleep again in Herot, and so the great mead hall stood empty and stayed empty. Grendel the monster now ruled in Denmark, a rule of terror that haunted Hrothgar and all his people, Wherever they lived, men, women and children alike, for twelve long winters Grendel warred unceasingly on the Danes, picking his blood victims at random, the innocent and the sick too, children and newborn babes. He was utterly without mercy. Again and again he came to his killing ground, always unseen in the black of night. No plan, Hrothgar and the council thanes devised could protect them from his fury. No prayers to the Almighty, no sacrifices to the ancient heathen gods. Anywhere he struck, any farmstead, any cottage, anywhere and everywhere, nothing could be could, would put an end to these endless terror raids. A great and terrible grief darkened the land, banishing all happiness, all hope. Even the noble Hrothgar sank, sat sunk in sorrow. Deep in his despair, the Danish king could see no reprieve from this hideous nightmare, visited so often upon his people by this fearful monster. By now the story of this dreadful tragedy, of the nightly suffering Hothgar and his people were enduring, had spread far and wide. They had heard about it too across the water in the land of, the, uh, of King Hyglak of the Geats. For a long time, faithful allies of the Danish kingdom but one, only one of them, the greatest and bravest of all princes, Beowulf he was called, decided that this evil beast of the might must be punished for his wrongdoing, that Hero must be cleansed of this wickedness and Hrothgar and his people saved at last, even if Beowulf had to give his own life to achieve it. Family and friends, Egthal his father and his uncle, the good King Hergelach himself, all of them, did what they could do to dissuade him from this reckless, perilous mission. But all the advice, all omens, only whetted Beowulf's determination to go to Denmark and to slay this monster at night. He ordered a strong and seaworthy ship to be fitted out for the quest and hand-picked 14 of the fiercest warriors he knew. Out of the sheltered fjord, they rowed this sturdy warship and set sail for Denmark, riding it through the wind-whipped waves of the sea. In brisk breezes the ship fair flew along, ploughing the storm-tossed ocean, until at last the shadow of the land along the horizon became the rearing cliffs and capes of Denmark. Soon Beowulf and his ring-mailed thanes were leaping ashore, each one thanking God most fervently for his safe arrival. From the cliff, a high above Hrothgar's startled watchman saw men land and wondered who they were, whether friend or foe. He rode down to the beach straight away and challenged them at the point of his spear. Who are you, strangers? Where do you come from? 
I see you are dressed and armed as warriors ready for battle. In all my years patrolling this coast, no one has landed more openly. You do not come like thieves in the night, and your faces speak to me of some honest purpose. I can plainly see that your prince, who stands head and shoulders higher than the rest of you, has the look of a hero about him, of great nobility and grace. Yet you are not known to us. Certainly Hrothgar has had no warning of your coming. So tell me your names and declare your intent frankly, so I may know whether to let you pass or not. Beowulf spoke up then, opening his heart honestly to the Danish coast guard. We have come from my lord Hroth Hygak, king of the Geats, your ally and your good friend. All the world knows of this piteous misfortune that has befallen this land, of all of that marauding monster Grendel and all his murderous massacres. We have come here to destroy him if we can, so lead us to Hrothgar, that great and glorious garden, guardian of his people. Take us to Herot, the heart of his kingdom, and take us there as fast as possible. There is no time to lose. You sound to me and you look to me as a man of your word, replied the ghost guard, coast guard. So accepting all in good faith, I will bring you myself to Herot, to my lord Hrothgar, who will, I know, rejoice at your coming. Meanwhile, while you are gone on your great and noble quest, my men will see to it that your ship is well guarded. So, in war dress of chainmail shirts, carrying their long ashen spears and great war shields, Beowulf and his warriors left the ship, anchored fast in the lee of the cliff, and marched inland, their helmets gleaming bright in the afternoon sun, strong helmets that would surely protect them against the worst any enemy could do, or so they thought. On they went until they saw at long last, in the distance, Hrothgar's home, Hirot, that glorious palace adorned with glowing gold, a house fit for any king on earth. Here the Coast Guard left them, pointing the way. I must return to re uh, resume my watch for sea raiders, he said. May the God we all love protect you in all you do, wherever you go, and bring you safely back to your ship again and back to your hearth and home. Weary now from their long sea journey, Beowulf and his warband made their way up the stone pass towards the Great Hall of Herot, where they were greeted by, at the gate by Wolfgar, Hrothgar's herald. Lay aside your shields and spears, he commanded them. Stack them against the wall, for you will have no need of them inside. I see friendship in your eyes, nobility in your bearing, and know that we have nothing to fear from you. But tell me who you are and what you've come for, dressed as you are for war. I am Beowulf, Prince of the Geats, nephew of Higlak the King, and if you would kindly allow us to speak face to face with Hrothgar, your gracious king, we will explain to him the full per in full the purpose of... There they are arriving. Our sea toss journey to the land of the Danes. Wolfgar the Herald was as wise in judgment as he was fierce in war and led them at once into Herot to meet Hrothgar, his beloved master, grey-haired now with sorrowing. These men, grim though they may look in their mail armour, have come in peace, I am sure of it, my king, Wolfgar declared to, before the king and his thanes. Chief among them and the renowned prince of the Geats, Geats is the noble Beowulf, nephew of Hyglak, your friend and ally of a lifetime. Such a trusty man can only have come to help us, I think. Suddenly, hope warmed the old king's heart as he looked upon Beowulf standing there before him. You will not remember me, he said. I knew you once as a child when I came to the land of the Geats. Ever since then, the Geats have been my lifelong friends and allies. You are most heartily welcome to Herod, for I know of you by hearsay also. Everyone here does. I heard tell that you possess the strength of at least 30 men in each hand. I am thinking and I am hoping and I am praying that you may have been sent here to us by God himself as our salvation to stand against Grendel, that fiend of the night. Perhaps, Beowulf, it is only you that has the power to deal with the monster, the death blow we long so long for, the end he so richly deserves. Mighty in his ring-meshed mail and glorious silver, Gloriously helmed in silver, Beowulf stood tall before Hrothgar and his thanes, every one of them, praying that this man would indeed prove to be their earthly redeemer, their strong avenger. 
They listened well as he spoke. I have come, great king of the Danes, Beowulf began, as Hyglax hearth kinsman, and in his name, I'm here to serve you as I have served him in many a battle. All the Geats have heard of your plight, of this evil Grendel, who after the shadows fall prowls this hall, making it his, light, his nightly lair. From seafarers and travellers we have learned how each night this most splendid of mead halls must be surrendered to Grendel, the night stalker, how he preys foully on your people, eating their flesh and drinking their blood. I am no poet, my lord king, nor harp player. I am a fighter. I am known at home and wherever I go as a warrior prince, as an enemy of all evil. I have only last year dealt death to five giants who threatened our land and broke their necks with my bare hands. I did the same to do dozens of sea serpents who plagued our waters. If I could do that much, I thought, then I could go over the sea to you, great Hrothgar, and offer to rid you of Grendel, this vile and loathsome destroyer. Why, I thought, should I not face him in such a tri in a trial of strength and destroy the destroyer? So I stand here in Hirot, your kingly hall and home, with my good companions ready and willing to serve you. All of us are strong and as steadfast in our determination to drive out this evil once and for all and bring peace and joy to your kingdom and to restore you at last to your rightful hearth. Be assured, I shall do all that is in my power to, ch to achieve it. It is my promise. Twelve long years of people in pain, with nothing but fear and hate in our hearts. Sadly, my hall and hearth companions have sorely dwindled in numbers by the ravages of this ruthless killer. So many have tried to stand against him, their courage wetted by beer, each roared his defiance, boasting, ale cup in hand, that he would wait here in Herot after nightfall and tear the evil one limb from limb when he came. But when morning came, it was always the same gruesome story. Here ought to become a slaughterhouse yet again. The walls blood spattered and the floors blood soaked. And my dear brave kinsmen all gone to, as meat to the monster's lair. But none of these was the mightier warrior as you, Beowulf. They had courage in full measure, but not the strength you have both. So bring your men, sit down, eat with us and drink with us. Tell us of the stories of your great exploits. For just to hear them would fill our hearts with new hope and happiness. Then a space was cleared at the banqueting table for Beowulf and his Geats. The horn of sweet mead was passed around from Geat to Dane, Dane to Geat. That evening the poet stood and sang his words, and the harp played softly, and the lilting lute and laughter echoed once again through the rafters of Herot. There were, it was true, some envious looks cast at Beowulf and his Geatish warriors, and some envious words too. Amongst the Danish thanes, a few did not care to be outshone in this manner and felt their honour threatened. Some challenged Beowulf openly, questioning his proud claim that he would succeed in this fight where they had not. Especially, they said, if he faced up to Grendel unarmed as he had proposed he would. Stung at these insults, Beowulf spoke up strongly in his own defence. Do not worry yourselves on our account. We'll soon show this monster Grendel strength, courage and a firmness of purpose he has never met before. Just because you have failed, don't imagine for one moment we shall do the same. We are made of sterner stuff than you think. Mark my words, by daylight the reign of this terror tyrant will be over. We have come to do this with, and with God's help we shall achieve it. The more Hrothgar heard, that kind and generous king, that great father protector and shepherd of all the Danes, the more he hoped and then believed the bear wolf could better the beast that night. Doubts disappeared and all envy too as the harp music rose to the rafters and laughter echoed once again about the great mead hall. Bearing the precious tre treasure cup, Hrothgar's queen came now to Hirot to meet these Geatish heroes, to greet and honour them. But to the peerless Hrothgar, her husband and her beloved, she offered the treasure cup first and afterwards gave the cup to each of them, irrespective of age or rank, for she was always gracious and kind to all. Then to Beowulf she came, glittering in her regal beauty, her arm rings glowing gloriously. Offering, offering him the cup, she thanked him warmly and the good lord who had sent him for coming so nobly to their aid. Accepting the treasure cup and her thanks most graciously, Beowulf rose to speak. 
We have come here, my lady, rowed and sailed our way across the surging seas for only one reason, to carry out the wishes of the great Hrothgar, your husband and king, and our friend and perfect ally, to accomplish the death of this Grendel, and end this forever the terror that stalks this place and for all your people, or to fail in the attempt and meet our end. No words had ever sounded sweeter to this lady, this splendid queen of the Danes. The poet sang then of the victory to come, of the foul fiend destroyed, destroyed and evil banished, and the Geat and Dane alike raised their rousing voices till all Herot resounded once more to the ringing rafters. But now, as he looked out, Hrothgar saw the shadows lengthening and knew the time was coming to quit the hall. He knew, as they all did, that outside in the failing dark, which would soon very very soon drown the world, the dreaded monster was leaving his lair again, was already gliding through the brooding shadows towards Herod. Hrothgar and Beowulf, great heroes both, saluted one another in love, and in parting Hrothgar spoke his last words. I now hand over... Hirot to you, brave Beowulf, to have and to hold throughout this night. Guard it well. I know that in the fight to come you will stretch every sinew, summon up all the strength and courage you possess. In return, should you survive and the beast be destroyed, I promise before everyone here I will show you more generosity than a king has ever shown before to any man. So saying, Hrothgar and his queen led the Danes from the hall. Only Beowulf and his geetish thanes remained, charged now with the safety of the kingdom. <coughs> The time is soon coming, so let each of us put our trust in God, Beowulf said to his men. But in our strength and fighting skills also, do this and we shall not fail. And with that he took off his coat of mail and his helmet as he had vowed to do. He unbuckled his war sword too and then gave all his armour and weapons to his faithful attendant. Before going to their beds, the Geats gathered together one last time, set forehead to forehead, drinking deep of one another's courage, fiercer now than ever in their fiery determination. We ask the Lord to bless our endeavours tonight, Beowulf whispered. Remember, we fight this time in his name. It would be easy to come at the beast with weapons, but I shall cut short this monster's life with my own God-given strength. Let God choose which of us shall triumph and, and we shall have no fear of losing. Believe that, my friends, and we shall win. So Beowulf went to his bed his, and his men too, but in truth they slept only fitfully, for there was not one of them, not Beowulf himself even, who could be certain of how the night would end, whether any of them would ever again see the light of dawn. They were, knew well enough how many Danes this, this Grendel creature had dragged lifeless and bleeding from Herot, how unlikely it was that some of or all of them would ever see their hearth and home. In silent prayer, each of them placed his life in the hands of the Almighty Maker, who had from the very beginning ruled supreme in the, all affairs of men. Up in his lair and through the shadows came Grendel, this stalker of the night, while in Herod the war warriors lay to turn-tossed in their sleep. Only one of them left on ever watchful guard, every moment stealing himself for the ordeal of battle he knew must very soon come, and it was coming too. Grendel came gliding through the swirling moorland cloud mist, death dealing in his hate-filled heart, thirsting to kill again that night as he had so often before. Down from the forest came Grendel now, saw the mead house, scented the sweet flesh of those inside, easy victims, e as easy as before, he thought. Had the monster known what awaited him there, he would most surely have thought twice, slunk back to his lair and never returned, for this would be the last time the beast was ever to go out on a killing spree. Never more would the terror tyrant stalk the land. Now it was his turn to suffer the panic of fear and the pain of death agony, so the giver of death and destruction would become the receiver at last. He did not know it yet, though. He had come on unawares to hear it. Rage wrapped on wreckage bent, Grendel ripped open the iron-studded doors. They were no hindrance to him. He scanned the dark hall through fire-blazing eyes, saw the slumbering thane still drowsy in sleep, the solitary, startled at st sentry, the whole war band. Rejoicing at the prospect of another fesh feast, this vile and vengeful creature laughed out loud at his good fortune. He would tear each and every one of them to pieces, stain Herot's floor once more with their lifeblood. At a night of gore and gluttonous pleasure lay ahead of him, or so it seemed. 
And so it began, too. As he snatched up the first Geetish sentry he saw, and skill he was called, and simply tore him apart, bolting his flesh in great gobbets, gnawing and gnashing on his bones, stripping the meat, sucking the veins, until in moments of nothing the poor helpless man was left. Sorry, nothing of the poor helpless man was left. Not a hair on his head, not a hand, not a foot, not even a nail. That was just the beginning for him, he thought. On to his next victim he pounced, reaching out to grab him with his killing claws. But now he was met with a grip of steel. A grip harder, tighter than he had ever known that seized him, held him fast by the arm. Locked in the vice of this grip, he could not break free, however much he struggled, and he knew at once he had met his match. Filled with sudden fear, the monster struggled again and again to unloose this fist, yearning only now to be away from Herot and home again in the safety of his lair. Vainly he tried to pull away, but Beowulf's fingers fastened harder still in an ever-tightening grip around this callous killer's arm. How Grendel longed to get out to escape to the forests and fens, but no power on this earth could force Beowulf to release his grip. Now Grendel knew, this merciless, murderous ogre, that he should never have come this night, that his death was coming and that, despite all his efforts to tear himself away, there was nothing he could do to prevent it. No way he could save himself. Fear of this death drove him, drove him mad with anger, and anger only made him stronger. He would fight to the death to save himself. He would never give in. It was amazing that Herod was not split asunder that night. So ferocious was the wrestling between these two giants. Locked together in this deadly embrace, they reeled and writhed about the mean reed hall, so that all Danes outside could hear a dreadful cacophony of crashing and crying resounding through the Herod. Gold-worked trappings and iron braces, all well-made and sturdy, simply snapped and buckled as the two of them, in deadly earnest, wrestled and grappled and struggled with one another. There was no ground given in this terrible fight, nor mercy either. So they fought on, this Grendel now fear-soaked, his strength failing him, and brave Beowulf, fists still clenched around the monster's arm, knowing he had only to cling on and not let go, to banish to hell forever the damned one, God's and his worst own, uh, own worst enemy. Clearly, outside, they heard the monster's demon scream, his hideous howling screech, the sound of it chilled every listener to the bone, yet hope gladdened them too, for these they knew were not human cries, but rather the strident sobbing of the beast in agony and terror. Seeing Grendel thus pinioned by the Geetish hero and tortured and weakened by his pain, Beowulf's companions in arms drew their swords and sprang now to his side to help him in his fight, to finish, if they could, this murderer's wretched life. They were not to know, Beowulf's battle friends, that no man-made sword nor steel could pierce this cruel creature's enchanted hide. Only naked strength could end his unnatural life. Grendel understood this, and he knew he was weakening, that his end must be near. He could think of no possible way to escape. Great-hearted Beowulf, sensing his sagging strength, had him still by the arm, now twisted it and turned it until the shoulder muscles split apart, the tendons snapped, the bone joints burst, and Grendel's arm was ripped and wrenched, bleeding from his body. Then Grendel fled, armless and half-dead already from Herot. Over the moors he staggered and stumbled, through the fens back to his den, knowing all the while that this was his last day on earth, that his life's blood was draining from him, that he was dying his death. So Beowulf the Good had triumphed in his bitter fight with Grendel the Evil One. Thus were all Danish hopes fulfilled and Beowulf's promise to them too. He had destroyed the great destroyer with his bare hands, saved Hrothgar's royal mead house and the Danish people from further terrors and given them back the sanctuary of their hearth and their home so that everyone should know that the tyrant was truly dead and their grief finally at an end. The hero hung high on the gables of Herot where all could see it and marvel at it too. That whole torn off limb, shoulder, arm and hand gruesome witness to the monster's violent end. 
By the next morning, the news of the great fight at Tirot had spread throughout the land. They came in their hundreds from the seashore, from the fens and the moors and the mountains, from near and far to see this hideous limb hanging there in the hall, and then to follow the fiendish foe's last footprints through the shadowy forest and moor mist, tracking the trail of blood to the monster's marsh pool. To this remote and dismal place, the dying monster had come only hours before, the last of his blood ebbing fast with every faltering step. Here he had dived to his miserable death, his hot, rudened blood bubbling and boiling in the brackish waves. So he had sunk at last to his cavernous lair below, and had died there alone in his agony to be welcomed back into hell where he belonged. Beowulf's, mar Beowulf's marvellous feat was now the talk of Herot, with all the Danish lands beyond. None was his equal, they said. None was braver, nor more worthy even, to be the king here in Denmark in his own right. And this was not said to slight the great Hrothgar, for he was a good and much-loved king for, of his people, but only in praise of Beowulf and his great courage and strength. That day the poet wove his word song, told the story of the hero here in Glowing. Golden language rang the word changes, and all who were remembered told it again and again, so that their children and their children's children should never forget the daring deeds and the noble name of Beowulf either. That evening they were all summoned to Herot to hear the splendid Mihal freed now, forever from Grendel's evil reign, and cleansed of the night's horrors. Beowulf, the great, as guest of honour, came with Hrothgar the king and his glorious queen, with all her maidens following. And the gathering there to, uh, and gathering there too, thronging Hrothgar's happy hall, were all the thanes, warriors, anyone who could find a place, each of them gazing in awe at the sight of Grendel's dreadful arm hanging there from the rafters. But it was not chief, uh, chiefly this grisly reminder they had come for, but to see Beowulf, their great champion, sitting beside good King Hrothgar, and to show their joyous triumph and their relief at this timely blessed deliverance. Taking his stand on the steps, his queen and Beowulf on either side, Hrothgar began his speech of thanks, and there all listened to every gracious word. Let our thanks be first to God above for his mercy, to the master of heaven and the master of this earth, worker of all miracles, for it is he who has brought Grendel to his death at last. I will be honest with you, until yesterday, until Beowulf came, I doubted whether Grendel, and I curse his name for all the grief he brought to us, would ever be overcome. Whether the, this loveliest of meat halls could ever truly be ours again, whether the damned demon's bloodletting slaughter could ever be brought to an end. Then God sent us this man, this hero amongst men, now here at my side, the noble Beowulf, and his companions in arms, and together they have achieved in one night what we have tried and failed to do in twelve long years of sorrow. What mother would not be proud to have borne a son such as this? What father does not yearn for a son like Beowulf? So, Beowulf, best of men, from this moment I cherish you as I would my own son. And as I promised before, anything that is in my gift you shall have, and it shall be a small reward for your great service to us all. Know also that your deeds will bring you greater riches still, which are my undying honour and gratitude and love, and that of all my people too. May Almighty God grant you always the success you enjoyed last night wherever you go, whatever the fight, whatever, whoever the foe may be. And the cheering that followed this rang loud in the rafters of Herod, and was only silence when Beowulf himself began to speak. It was not at all in a proud or boasting tone. That was never his way. We came here willingly, my warriors and I, to challenge the evil, on, evil one on your behalf, and with God's help we prevailed. Yet I am sorry to see you hanging up there is only his arm. I should have preferred you to see the rest of him here too. I tried my utmost to hold him fast, to squeeze the light out of him, life out of him, but I did not have a good enough grip on him to prevent his escape. By tearing himself away and leaving behind his arm, he must have hoped too to save himself from death. Wretched creature. But God did not wish it, and so the fiend lives no more. He will no more haunt your land nor plague your people. Like any other murderous criminal, he waits now God's own justice. We may have his arm, but God has his evil soul and will do with him as he pleases. Right, we're going to finish it there. Okay.